On this July morning, a group of men and women will rendezvous with history. For the first time, an African head of state will face charges of crimes against humanity, war crimes, and torture. The accused is Essen Abre, the president of Chad from 1982 to 1990. Bringing charges against Abre is a turning point for Africa. This is a turning point for justice. Africa is taking responsibility for one of its sons who slaughtered his own people. Before I die, I want to see Isen Abe receive punishment. That's my goal. I haven't fought for 25 years for nothing. I am now in Dakar to testify in Isen Abre's trial to find out why he arrested me. There was a group of us who said, no, we are never going to give up. We were going to fight this until his and Habre died or went to court. Ladies and gentlemen, it is with immense emotion that I'm standing here at this moment representing 4,445 victims over 15 years. This emotion comes from having the exceptional honor, along with my colleagues, and the thousands of victims of the bloody and violent crimes. To be the mouthpiece of the voiceless, the missing, the dead, the tortured, of all those who suffered at the hands of Isen Abre, but who will never have the chance to tell you their stories. J'appelle Monsieur Isen Abre au prétoire. Issa Nabre refused to testify during his eight-month trial. He had not a single word to say to the hundreds of victims who day after day testified against him. The former dictator denied the legitimacy of the court and rejected his attorneys. When the police captured him in his villa in the Senegalese capital, Essen Abre had been living there freely for 23 years, despite an international warrant for his arrest. In exile in Senegal since the fall of his regime in 1990, most people did not believe he had been arrested. We were naive, and it makes me laugh today. Everything came together to prosecute Issen Abre, despite his being a former head of state in Africa. And the African Union is nothing but a group of heads of state who protect each other. When we say union, that is what it means. The charges against Issen Abre were the product of 15 years of relentless work by activist Reed Brody on behalf of the victims. The dictator hunter, as he is sometimes called, focused on the brutality of Aubrey's DDS. The agency was instructed to fight both real and imaginary opponents of the regime. In the abandoned offices of the DDS, Reed Brody made a major discovery. We go into the building and there, you know, in room after room, ankle deep, tens of thousands of documents. These documents had not been touched, you know, for seven or eight years, and they were just strewn across the floor. And we started to bend down and pick up these documents, and we realized, you know, that this was, these were the files of Hissen Habre's political police. There'll be a decisive factor in Aubrey's indictment, 
The files contained detailed lists of the victims who died in prison. La DDS. The DDS was a huge organization with thousands of agents, but they were all supervised and all headed by Habre directly. According to the evidence, testimonies, and documents that the DDS received, the Commission's estimate is of 40,000 victims. Deep down, the Commission believes it's a low estimate, extremely low. I was chosen to be one of the grave diggers. Everyone knows me as Mr. Gravedigger. The Plain of the Dead is a place where we buried people, five inmates and I. We buried them at night and thousands of others during the day. I was arrested on July the 12th, 1985 in Jamena. Two men came up to me that night in the light rain. They said they had one or two questions for me, that they would keep me for five to ten minutes. You'll be surprised to know that ten to fifteen minutes lasted four years. These people were not considered as human beings and were showed no respect after their death. They were buried like tree trunks, without a shroud, but... <sighs> no, Isenabre must be tried. Or else we'll make one of the biggest mistakes in history. How did Isan Abre become such a bloody dictator? In the absence of an explanation from the man himself, there is one story that dates back to 1975. It helps shed a little light on the subject. Chad is a former French colony, twice the size of France itself, mostly desert and surrounded by six countries. A 33-year-old political science graduate called Isan Abre leads a rebellion against the French. In the desert region of Tbilisi, the people support his nationalistic rhetoric. Chadien, les frères, les sœurs, grands et petits, je vous salue. C'est la révolution. Years of chaos and conflict follow. Rebel factions fight each other. But in June 1982, Abre emerges the victor in the capital, in Jamina. The revolutionary proclaims himself president. But shortly after seizing power, the young head of state faces a threat from neighboring Libya. Colonel Muammar Gaddafi wants to annex Chad. Like Abre, he's ambitious, but he has something that Abre doesn't. Libya's oil allows him to line his pockets with money. In pursuit of his Pan-African ideals, Gaddafi occupies Chad's Aouzou Strip, which borders Libya. Gaddafi arms the rebels against Issan Abre. In Chad and around the world, Gaddafi threatens the interest of Western governments, supports revolutionary movements, and finances international terrorism, which makes Issan Abre a man the West will support at any price. I, Ronald Reagan, do solemnly swear that I will faithfully execute the office of President of the United States. When the President Reagan came into power, we were instructed to do everything possible to stop Libyan activities. America was not going against Gaddafi. He was just doing everything to foment revolution. So 
In that context, uh, Chad became an important area for us. The United States did not care in Chad, per se, but they did have a very strong interest in reining in the ambitions of, of Colonel Gaddafi. What we did was we assessed what Chad needed. The Chadian soldier is more point and shoot. Uh, it had to be pretty simple. It was part of my function to coordinate all that. The United States arms the regime of Isan Abre, but France hesitates. The socialist Francois Mitterrand wants a new approach to Africa, less interventionist. He sends advisor Roland Dumas to talk to Gaddafi. I told him, let's decide a border together. You go just to that point, and we're going to protect you in what we'll call the useful Chad. If you go beyond that, it's war. Muammar Gaddafi agrees not to go beyond the 16th parallel, a symbolic border which separates pro-Libyan troops from Abre's troops. We want to work with you, but on our terms. If it doesn't work, there will be a confrontation. But two years into his rule, President Abre creates international headlines when his regime carries out its first massacre in the South. As part of the preparation for Abre's trial, Attorney Jacqueline Modena returns to the region where the armed rebels, the Kodos, fought against Abre and sought to secede. The government gave them a meeting at the Daily Farm. It's an experimental farm. The idea was to organize a reconciliation, surrender the weapons, and allow the Kodos to reunite with the National Army. In this isolated place, Essen Abre's army ambushes the Kodo rebels. The first time I came here, in February of 2000, the guard, who was an eyewitness, made me walk among the trees, and we saw bones everywhere. At 10.45 in the morning, a vehicle full of soldiers arrived. According to the first witness, there were about 710 people. The area was crowded, he told us. The soldiers opened fire on anything that moved. The farmland was covered with bodies, and the bodies were buried all around here. This farm is one of the symbols of the massacre in the south. There are entire villages that were burned. When the soldiers found people praying in the churches, they killed them. They burned those people in the churches as they prayed. It was a real massacre in 1984. The army of Essen Abre kills without mercy and represses the south, while the world looks to the north. Gaddafi violates his tacit agreement with France. Pro-Libyan troops cross the symbolic border at the 16th parallel and advance on the capital of Chad. Think Mitterrand was anxious to avoid commitment in Chad, but he couldn't escape it. He and his government could not escape it in reality. L'opération Manta a commencé. Plus de 300 berets rouges de l'infanterie de marine attendu à N'Djamena, une opération militaire baptisée Manta, que Paris a décidé de lancer devant l'aggravation des combats au nord du pays, dans la région de Fayalarjo. Issen Abre gets what he wanted, the engagement of the French military. Gaddafi backs down and signs an agreement with Francois Mitterrand. He agrees to withdraw his troops from Chad. Oh, wow. 
As soon as Hissen Abre became the chief strategist in a country that is strategic for us, we began to let him do as he liked. He found himself in a position of great importance for the French and at the same time for the Americans. We gave him carte blanche. We closed our eyes to what he was doing. From the moment we told him, all we ask of you is that you keep a hold on your country, how could he not abuse that position? Essen Abre is named the lion of the UNIR party, the National Union for Independence and Revolution. Thousands of Chad citizens fall victim to his ferocious reign. During our investigation, we uncovered seven detention centers in N'Djamena alone. As one former detainee said, N'Djamena was nothing but a big prison. Mr. President, this small cell of less than 20 square feet, I assure you, held eight people. So, to save our legs, I would stick myself against the wall and I let my fellow prisoner in front of me put his right leg over my left shoulder. He put his left leg over my right shoulder so he could sleep. When I get tired, I tap on his leg. Then he takes my position and he takes his turn with my legs on him. I saw my first food on the third day. I was given rice to eat, but I could not swallow. It felt like there was sand in the rice. Frankly, if you gave it to the animals, they would not eat it either. I assure you of that. That's the reason we got sick. But now the Americans and the French cannot say that they were not aware of these things. Right next to the detention centers, you have the residence of the ambassador of France. And in front of the DDS, there's USAID, an American organization. And when we carried the bodies to the plane of the dead, we would walk past the French troops, which were sometimes watching the area from their helicopters. I think now they can't say that they didn't know anything. One of the very first documents we picked up was the report of a training course in the United States uh, for a number of DDS agents including some who were listed later as the most feared torturers in Chad. We see from the entry log of the DDS, the liaison from the US to the DDS was coming in and out of the DDS. It would be really hard to say that the US did not know what was going on. Of course, we knew about human rights violations. Uh... In Chad. It was not an issue for us. As I said before, our main focus was Libya. Of course, we frequently have to help people we, who are not very nice to, to do our things, but uh, we did not regret anything there. It is real politics, yes. <laughs> International politics is very often like that, you know. It's a bit cynical. We knew very well it was not a democratic government. By the mid-80s, Gaddafi still has troops in northern Chad. He ignores the agreements with Francois Mitterrand. The tone escalates between Libya and France. Pas de forces étrangères au Chad. Le respect de cet accord est la règle d'or. Du retour à la paix. La France est entièrement engagée par le respect de cet accord, dès lors qu'il serait respecté d'autre part. But Gaddafi still dreams of conquering Chad. France launches Operation Sparrowhawk in support of Issen Abre. 
L'aviation française a bombardé ce matin un aérodrome au nord du Tchad. C'est un avertissement au colonel Kadhafi. We showed Gaddafi in that moment that he would not succeed if he tried to play with us. The French and Americans now share the same position. Libya is a threat to regional stability. It must be stopped. They arm Isan Abre, who attacks the pro-Libyan forces in the desert. It's the beginning of the Toyota War, and it ends with the taking of Waridun, the stronghold of Colonel Gaddafi in Chad. Isan Abre, in the end, destroyed the Libyan armored corps and killed thousands of Libyan troops. That would not have happened if there had not been effective French-American cooperation. I hope that your viewers appreciate what was accomplished by the Chadians militarily to defend themselves and their country. Anyway, it, it led to an invitation from the White House to President Habre. President Habre and I are convinced that the relationship between our countries will continue to be strong and productive. It was an honor and a great pleasure to have had him here as our guest. Thank you. Yes. Monsieur le Président, le Chad comme les États-Unis chérit au plus haut point la paix, la liberté, la justice et, le, et la protection des droits de l'homme et des peuples. But after seven years in power, Aubrey is obsessed by the threat from within. In 1989, his paranoia reaches new heights when his former chief of staff, Idris Debe, becomes leader of a rebel group. The men of Debe's tribe, the Zagawa, become targets. In N'Djamena, they are held in a swimming pool, a prison that becomes emblematic of a country plunged into horror. It's like you go into a hole and there are prison cells everywhere. Length 3.13 meters, width 3.02 meters, height 4 meters 70, and with its small windows that do not let in enough air for the detainees to breathe. It's a death trap. And then, two terrorist attacks strike the West. Two airplanes explode in flight, one at Lockerbie in Scotland, the other in the desert. The disasters bear the signature of Colonel Gaddafi. The United States now wants to physically eliminate the Libyan leader. And Isen Abre is happy to oblige. A few kilometers from N'Djamena, the CIA is running a secret camp for the purpose of training former Libyan prisoners. It's like Reagan. It's really Reagan's style. Abre captured two or three thousand prisoners in the war against Gaddafi. These two or three thousand, we put them in a camp, virtually handed them over to the Americans, so that one day they could become a heavily armed force that could push Gaddafi out of power. France is not happy that the United States is treading on its toes in Africa. The director of the DGSE goes to Chad to meet Essan Abre. So Mr. Abre sees me half an hour late. There's a lot of tension. And by the time I leave, I know I'm basically going to do my best to get him out. Because he wanted to make me feel that he didn't need us anymore that he didn't need France, that he had another alliance lined up without ever saying anything. He had another alliance, so he could do without us. Right then, he put himself in jeopardy. 
If we left him alone to play his games and go to war against Gaddafi, it would leave the region in flames, and hell by extension, the rest of Africa too. France already had a ready replacement for Abre. His former chief of staff, who had fled to Sudan for his safety, Idris Deby. The French troops moved into N'Djamena, keeping their guns at their sides. Estenabre fled to Senegal. In his absence, the prisons opened to reveal their grisly secret. The people of Chad discover the extent of the regime's crimes. The new president appoints a board of inquiry to collect testimony from victims and investigate the mass graves. In its final report, the commission recommends putting Essenabre on trial. But Idris Deby does nothing for 20 years. Idris Deby's relation to this case has always been very complex. On the one hand, he was Hissen Habre's military chief during one of the bloodiest periods uh, of the Habre government. On the other hand, after he broke from Hissen Habre, many of his best friends and many family members uh, were uh, killed by Hissen Habre. When you're the authoritarian president of a country and simple citizens have brought to justice the previous president, it's very, it's an uncomfortable situation. It's a democratic victory that you don't, you know, necessarily want to be encouraging. I think we need the truth to have the power to change. The past shows we did not care about human beings, but we cannot develop our country without taking care of people first. Development goes hand in hand with humanity. We cannot say, too bad, we killed people, and then put money into development. What are we developing if you do that, and for who? It is their fault. I believe that both France and the US manipulated Abré. They gave him weapons, so it is their fault. I think that once Issen Abré's trial is over, will have to deal with the powerful countries that were behind him. They contributed materially, financially, and personally to the deaths of Chadian people. They must be held accountable. Let them get ready for that, because we won't leave them alone. Isen Abre is to appeal against his conviction. He refused to recognize the legitimacy of the court that convicted him of his atrocities. You can see our film again via our website, francefancat.com. Thank you for watching Reporters Plus. Stay with us here on France Fancat.